to our first Zoom call from our Facebook group. And you'll recognize Victoria uh, Crowder. You saw her in an interview. And Victoria is going all in for Na no Remo. <laughs> well, I've got that right. National Novel Writing Month. And she's really going to take it on as a full on challenge. I'm going to take it on as a micro challenge uh, to work on my novel uh, at least a little bit every day. Quentin, are you taking on some sort of uh, November writing challenge? Uh, I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we what we're going to learn today, I'm going to turn the floor over to Victoria in just a moment here, because she's going to tell us all about what it is that she's doing to prepare for November. She calls October prep uh, preptober. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. And so we will let her tell us what she is up to. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me and, and setting everything up. I feel like all I have to do is just log in and I'm good to go. It's so nice. E easy to do. Um, okay, so let's get right to it. This is the first year that I'm officially participating in NaNoWriMo with a novel. I've always had other writing projects that were going. And so the month of November is just a really great time to capture that momentum of everyone that's participating around the world. So that's what I use it for. I've always used it as a way to kind of align my projects and make sure that I'm pushing forward, especially coming into the new year. For me, I find that it's easy to lose momentum as you get down to the last months of the year and, and holiday and family and all the things that happen. So it's a nice check-in in October that then provides a ramp to sort of catapult you into the new year on a high note. Um, with that said, I'm going to give you just a quick bird's eye view of how I align things like personally in the family, in the home, since, you know, I'm the mom. So yeah air traffic control right here. Then I'm going to go through the tools I use and then uh, specifically how I line things up so that I'm ready to hit the ground running on November 1st, which is the kickoff for National Novel Writing Month, which is NaNoWriMo. So the first thing that I always recommend to my own writing students to do is you have to help others around you understand that number one, this is something that's important to you. This is something that you want to commit to, even if it's on a small level, maybe you're, you're going to commit to writing twice a week and that's what you're capable of. That's fine. It doesn't have to be the big goal, which is, you know, a thousand to several thousand words a day. So whatever your goal is, commit to that goal and then share that with the people around you. And then it's what I like to call bringing them into the fold. So the first thing that I do is I try to minimize anything that I schedule during that month of November. So part of my preptober, which is the month of October, is getting everything ready for November. So I minimize anything that's scheduled. I don't schedule dentist appointments, oil changes, any of those little things that creep into our writing time from our lives. I try to get rid of all of that for the month of November. Then I do what my coach friend, Coach Carrie, calls it coast meals. Since, you know, I, I live on a cattle ranch and dinner is a big deal at our house. So I try to put together things that can easily be prepared even better if I don't have to do it. So a couple of weekends ago, I made a huge pot of chili, portioned that out for meals, I made a big stew, portion that out. So literally anyone in the household can heat and eat and I don't have to be in the kitchen. So that's automatically saving me 90 minutes to two hours of my day. So if I know that everyone is in the kitchen and they can be doing dinner and I can come in and sit down for maybe that hour, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of time, then bingo, I've got my writing time cut out for me. So start to think ahead of where can I carve out pockets of time by rallying my troops, asking for help, and then making that important writing time possible. If you commit to it and get them on board, you'll be way more successful than if you're trying to go it alone. Um, a quick note about chores and things, I try to front load all of that in October as well. So, you know, I'm gonna do all of the bedding. I, I, the ranch is dusty, you know, I'm gonna deep clean, 
And, and here's where you have to really be honest with yourself about who you are. What things derail you? If there is cleaning to be done, I guarantee I will do that first. As much as I love writing, if I know I need to do vacuuming, I want to do some stuff in the kitchen, whatever, I'm always thinking to myself, I can knock that out first. Don't hamstring yourself by leaving those items undone. Use the month of October to get your household in order, get your pantry stocked, you know, delegate chores that other, you know, other people can do. My kids can take the trash down on Tuesday, whatever. Rally those troops to help you to make you successful. Then the final thing that I always do, and this is the month before, excuse me, the week before the month of November. So that last week of October is when I do my environment. So you can't see the library, but to this side is a wall of bookcases. And to this side is my big filing drawers, the double wide wooden filing drawer cabinet and my side table. And then in front of me is a set of windows that look out towards the west to the timber. So anything in my line of sight that could pull my attention or draw my focus I move it and put it away, put it in a cabinet, put it in a cupboard. I don't want to be looking at anything that's going to pull my focus away from writing. The number one thing for me is I do a lot of mending. Hey, Yvonne, welcome. Um, I, I, you know, I'm always mending jeans, mending a sweater. I love to hand embroider, which figures into my novel, by the way. So on the other side of the room in the corner, there is a, a sitting chair with my sewing basket underneath. Uh-uh, that gets put away. So I'm not looking at anything that's going to pull my attention. And then I tidy the bookcases. I make sure that I only have at hand the books that I'm using for research or that I'm working into my Zettelkasten, which sits behind me in this file box. So it's so critical that you short circuit those things that are going to suck your time away because I guarantee they will, especially when you're in the heat of the moment and you're thinking, ah, I can do those words tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and do this or that or the other. Get it all out of your way from the get-go. Set yourself up for success. If I could give you one piece of advice, that's what I would say is clear out as much mental and physical clutter so that you can focus and just do your writing. Um, I also, some of you know this, if you've seen my interview, I take the months of October, November, and and December off. I'm very fortunate in the work that I do that I can set up my own schedule. And I know a lot of people don't have that luxury. I'm very grateful that I can do that. But we also travel. We're leaving next Wednesday. We'll be gone 10 days in Colorado on an elk hunt. So that 10 days is my official kickoff for NaNoWriMo because I will do a huge chunk of writing during that off-grid time. I mean, there's no cell service. There's nothing. So it's just me, pens and pencils, timelines, which I'm going to show you in a minute. It's just for writing. So if you don't have that luxury, it's even that much more important that you set yourself up to win in November. Get all of those things off the table, get yourself ready to go. So let's talk for just a second about tools. I always begin this section with new writing students by telling them, I fully understand this is not necessary. These are things that bring me joy, that get me deep into that space of, I can't wait to get to my writing. It begins, as many of you know, colored pens. I cannot say enough about it. I color code my characters. So for example, when I start a new story, I create for myself a color grid. Every character gets a color, especially if it's a multi point of view story. And that allows me to track who's speaking, who needs to speak next? Whose point of view is this chapter from? It just gives me a colorful visual that I can use to chart that story plot line. So colored pens, obviously lots of colored post-it notes, have to have those. And then flags, like these page flags. I use lots of page flags, again, just to lock in that visual colorization so that when I look at my big board, I can see chapter by chapter, scene by scene, whose point of view it is. And then I can often see, okay, this point of view has had five scenes or five chapters. Do I want to break that up? Do I want to insert conflict or tension? It's just a nice way to visually represent your story. So if you are color motivated or you like to have those visual cues, lay all of those tools in. Don't 
don't give yourself the out of, well, you know, I need to go find my colored, my uh, note cards, or, you know, I only have three by five cards, I need to go find my larger cards, right? Don't allow yourself those excuses, get all that stuff ready, get it at hand and have that be the only thing you're looking at. So you're not looking at the cable bill or the internet bill that's sitting over there giving you the evil eye, get that stuff out of your line of sight. Then for those of you that have gone online and seen uh, my settle costume class, I have a set of folders, all right? These are primarily red, but there are green ones for the eight plot points. So this is just a quick overview. I have 24 red folders. Each one is a potential scene or plot point in a 24 plot point story structure, okay? Then there are eight green folders, one spaced every three folder, and those mark for me the key events. So you have the hook, right? The hook is what brings your reader right into the story from the very beginning. You have an inciting incident. An inciting incident is the thing that puts your character on that path and they're not going to turn away from it. Maybe, you know, something burns down, something blows up. She finds out the secret, something that catapults that character into the story. So the folders are, consider that the first place in the nest, okay? So as I sit down to write and I'm thinking, all right, my character needs to do this. So if she needs to do this, where does that go? Well, that needs to go before the middle point of the story. It needs to go somewhere on this half. So I'm just going to drop maybe that card note into one of my early folders so it becomes a placeholder, okay? So having my set of folders and their companion, which I call this the plot sandwich. It's four discs and I use a disc punch and this is each of the story acts. So I've got act one, I've got act two, the first half, Act two, the second half, and then act three, okay? And so in between each of those three acts is one tab for each of the 24 plot points that correspond to my folders. Is it repetitive? Yes, and there's a reason for that. Put a pin in that and we're gonna come back to the repetition in a second. So I've got 24 folders, divided up by the eight plot points, and I've got 24 tabs divided up by the eight plot points. So that gives me two places where I can store the things that I'm writing on a daily basis. And for those of you that use a Zettelkasten, you already know each of those uh, story pieces, scenes, plot, ideas, whatever I'm writing, that's all getting numbered in my note box. And I'm not going to go into that because that's a whole separate thing. But this way, I can track my ideas and my rough stuff in my note box. And then as I'm fleshing those things out during the writing, they're either getting filed in their folder, or if it's something maybe I'm going to take out and work on the go, I'm just going to punch and stick that card into my plot sandwich and take it with me. So you have to remember, a lot of my writing is done in a tent in Colorado this year in the snow. So I'm not going to take my folders with me. I'm going to lean on the plot sandwich and use those 24 tabs to file my ideas so that I can keep track of them as I go. So wrapping up the tools, those are obviously analog, right? Analog is first. It's the slowest. It's the best. We know that from, from Shepherd's tribe. Once those analog pieces are in place, then I'm gonna create my digital correspondent. So that is, I use Scrivener. Scrivener's where I write all of my, well, I shouldn't say where I write, it's where I keep all of my drafts. I write by hand first on my cards, then I either write it out longhand for a scene or a chapter, and then transfer that into my Scrivener so I have a digital copy as well. So I'm gonna set up the same 24 points in my Scrivener. And then I'm going to divide those 24 by the eight key plot points. So that's a third iteration 
of the 24 potential plot points divided by the eight key plot points. And this one is digital. So you're thinking to yourself, holy cow, that's three different iterations of basically the plot story structure. But here's the thing. And I, I would suspect that Kathleen would back me up on this. Writing a story, a novel particularly, which you're looking at 50 to 70,000 words, depending on your genre, putting those 50 some thousand words into a full length novel is no easy task. And in the beginning stages, which is presumably where we are, you're just now starting to get those ideas. Okay, this could be my hook. This is going to bring the reader in. So I know that piece, but I don't know what my midpoint is yet. All you know is that you have to write from here to here, and you have to figure out how you're going to get your character along those points. Remembering all of those little details of how I could do this, if she makes this decision, it could go this way, or it could go this way. Which direction is that decision going to take her? And so forth. That's not easy to keep track of. So having the first place where I'm tucking away note cards in the potential order they could go. Having the second place, which is my files, which gives me, I can stick post-it notes on here and maybe put them in order, or I can just drop drafts in and order them later. That's a second way that I'm learning that story. I'm locking it into those pathways. And then the third digital option, when I've got enough on paper that I know how this is probably gonna go as a scene or a chapter, I'm loading that into my digital iteration. So it goes into my Scrivener and it gets fleshed out into what will be a completed chapter. By the time I've done all three of those things, that's pretty well locked in. And I know, okay, when this happens, she's gonna get completely freaked out and run out of the library because she just needs to take a walk and clear her head. I know that it's locked in there. I don't have to think about that or worry about it anymore. I can go on to the next plot point that that's gonna lead to. So the, though it seems redundant, the more that you can repeat those things, step through the story in your head and see them in front of you, either in your folders or in your note cards, that's how you lock in your story. And it helps you chart a course for where you need to get to next. So that covers all the tools of what I use to physically do the writing. Then we get to the actual task of writing. So if you watched my interview, I know that your free gift was the character development guide where I took you through a set of note cards and different things that you could put on each card for your character. So for example, on the first card, I have character name, their role in the story, date of birth and age, right? That's just a quickie card, you're gonna jot it out. Then you're gonna go to the next one and it's more in depth. Physical description, health, disabilities, handicaps, hair, eyes, tattoos, jewelry, and so forth. Doing all of your character work either in October as part of your prep or even earlier. I mean, I did a lot of this work several months ago and just kept filing it in my note box or dropping it in my folders as I created those pieces. The more you can do up front so that you have the raw materials of your story, whether that's your character, your settings, specific descriptions, any pieces that you can collect to start building your story world before you start that writing process also set you up for success because all of that then becomes part of the story in your head. So when it's November 1st and you sit down, maybe you're going to start somewhere in the middle of your story and you know what the midpoint is. You know what the big event that changes everything is. And so maybe you're going to write a little forward and you're going to write a little backward and you're going to start hanging those ideas on your plot points. If you've already scoped out what the scene looks like, you've written descriptions, maybe you've really gone crazy and created a Pinterest board with visuals for what the room looks like, what the environment looks like, what your character's wearing, any of those details that just really light that up in your mind, then when you sit down to do the writing, number one, you're going to be excited. 
because you're going to maybe look at that Pinterest board or you're going to open up that folder and see the, the magazine pages that you've torn out and taped in there as a visual. You're going to see those notes about I could do this or I could do that just after the midpoint. All of those things are going to feed your creativity. And that's the critical piece. If I could only give you a second piece of advice, in addition to setting up your environment and, and preparing your support system, it would be front load as much character and story work as you can, because that's what is going to ground you in your story world. And the more grounded and surround sound and smells and what does it look like and what do I want these characters to do what conflict can I just hammer and throw at them to keep the story going the more of that you know the more successful your writing sessions will be doesn't mean that they'll be super long you may only write 500 words in a day but that's 500 more words than you had the day before and that's a win so collect as much information as you can and even do some of the writing I mean I've I've got, I had an entire book one written before I broke it out to create two more books out of it. So it's now a trilogy. So my task for this NaNoWriMo is to complete from just before the midpoint to the end of the novel. So that's my goal. Um, the standard goal for the month is 50,000 words, which is about 1,660 per day. So if you want to just divide it out and do the math, figure out how many words do I want? Do I want to do a 50,000 word novel? Okay, that's 1,660 words a day. Do I just want to do a novella, which is only about 20 to 30,000 words? Okay, divide it out. How many do I need to do in a day and how many days can I give? So once you pencil out the math, if you're a math nerd like me, then you can kind of get a sense of, okay, I need to write a scene that needs to be 15 to 20 paragraphs long what kind of details do I need to set up to do that? And then you just reverse engineer your scene based on the research that you've done, which is why I say that is so critical. Um, and that brings us to the last piece, which is the research itself. So I'm very particular about having all of my things at hand. So for example, I will go through, and, and most of this is already done for me, except for a few pieces that I'm still chewing on. But first I will go through, as I said, I will have all the books that I might want to reference right at hand on the bookcase next to me. So I literally just look over, pick the thing I want and pull it. In the perfect universe, all of the research material that I'm planning to use is already filed in my Zettelkasten. So all I have to do is go to my notebox, pull that group of cards, it's already written, I lay them out and I can start hanging those details and ideas onto my formal chapter. If those things aren't done, however, one of the last things that I do as I get closer and closer to that start date is I pull one folder, one folder, and in it is all, all of the notes, all of the notes I have about this story, post-it notes, note cards, pieces of art paper I've ripped off of a pad, notebook paper, you name it, there's some of it in this folder. But this is every single note that I have outstanding for my story. I go through these and I put them all on one list. First of all, that review is a nice way to revisit those things that maybe you've been thinking about over the past few months. By putting them all in one list, you're lining up your ducks. That way, I'm going to sit down on day 18 of November, and I'm looking at my stuff, and I'm like, dang, I do not know what I'm going to write about today. I'm going to open up my notes list. Everything is right there, so I don't get distracted shuffling through and looking at stuff. It's all right in the list, and maybe I'm going to pick something off of that list, and that thread is what I'm going to work with today. The second piece that I do is I make sure that I have a super, super solid master timeline. The book that I'm writing now moves between the, the main backstory takes place around World War I, and it moves up to 2019, which is the present day for the story. So my main timeline, which is digital, it had to be Excel because I needed to be able to move things around efficiently. It's just not efficient to do this part by hand. So I have an Excel spreadsheet that at this point in time is 16 pages long. And it goes through all of my characters, all of the pieces, how they interact, things that might be important, 
day to day, year to year from it starts in 1043 and goes forward in time to 2019. So that timeline, which also you can see has calendars, like this is the calendar of months from 1915 because 1915 figures in as a prominent year for one of my characters. So I've printed out that calendar. Again, when I'm working on maybe the, the post-World One piece of the story, I'm not gonna go to the internet, which is so seductive, and search what happened, what day was July 4th in 1915? Because we all know, I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole that is gonna derail me for an hour if I look at the internet. No. I'm just going to pull out my calendar from 1915. I'm going to see what day I'm looking for. And then I'm done and I go back to writing. So don't allow yourself to get distracted by the intertubes. The second piece of my timeline predates the digital one and it's the handwritten one. So this is a, a piece of easel paper, as I know Kathleen is fond of. Love me some easel paper. And all of my character stories are somewhere in these graphs. You know, this character connects to that one. That needs to happen then. This one loops back to this story. So it's a crazy multi-directional timeline, which is what I use to build the digital one. I always like to have the handwritten one at hand because as we know, writing and seeing things in your own hand is extremely powerful. And often when I type something in, the context of how I wrote it is lost. So I need the visual of having that timeline. Now, putting together a timeline for your book, that could be a whole event of its own. So, you know, maybe now, because you've got a good couple of weeks before, before NaNoWriMo officially kicks off, pull out that big piece of paper or tape a few pieces of paper together, put the beginning part of your story at one end and what you think might be the end on the other, and just start filling in the dates, right? You don't have to worry about the 24 plot points yet. Just start filling in the dates. When was my character born? Is that significant? No, it's just a thing. Okay, fine. When does the story take place? What day of the week does it start on? And get those juices flowing so you start visualizing how to step through the action. That's just another way to prime the pump to get you ready to work on the story. Scenes and chapters. This is where I have to go all world over here. Before I ever begin writing, I print out in hard copy, every single scene and chapter that I have. Each one gets a number. I have little tabs, which I don't know if I can show you this, but I'll try. This, my friends, is the beast. This is a four inch three ring binder and it contains every chapter and scene that I've written for my book. Number one, having them in hard copy just makes me feel better because I have lost all digital work. It's been months ago, months ago, it was back in the spring, but my laptop and my backup hard drive both crashed within a month of each other and I lost everything on it. Not fun, I wouldn't recommend it. So now I print out every draft that I write and it just goes behind that tab in the folder and I have an index labeled, I think I'm up to 150. And I just line item, okay, number 75 is this scene, I file it behind 75. When I revise it, I print out the revised and it goes on top. So in the same way that I use the Zettelkasten to track research and character development and those pieces, I use my binder, which is indexed just numeric and every draft as it's written. So again, is it redundant? It absolutely is. But when I start leafing through those scenes and chapters and drafts, my eye catches something and I think, ooh, hey, this would be a great place to do that. And then I'm off on a new chapter. So it's having that analog visual cue of everything that you've written in one place. You don't have to worry about it because it's either in the binder if it's a chapter or scene or it's in the box if it's research. No question. And I don't have to look at the internet. So. That brings us to the very last piece, which is the note cards and the character stuff, which I've already touched on. So um, that's a lot. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. So a quick recap. Get your support system on board from the beginning, right? 
make this as important to the people who support and care about you as it is to you and you will have a much better experience. Set your tasks by first of all, gathering your tools, have everything you need at hand and dedicate a space. This is something that has meaning. This is important work. So give it its own ritual space to live for the duration of your writing. Now, I totally get you may have to clear off a table and sit down and do your work and then put the stuff back on the table. More power to you. Honor the process by giving your work a place to live of its own. After you've gathered your tools or while you're gathering your tools, I spend a lot of time waiting for the Amazon guy to bring stuff. Am I right? Ooh, I have to show you. I treated myself this year. Since I will be writing in the middle of Colorado with nothing but a cabin fire to keep me company while the guys are out hunting, I treated myself to this. It's a portable keyboard. Hey, and I can only take 65 pounds of gear. So number one, there are no books going with me. So everything either has to be in my computer or in my pad. And I have to be able to type because there's no electricity. So my laptop is only as good as the backup battery. So that was my little treat was a little six ounce removable keyboard. But get your tools together, do your character and your story work. If you don't know in your head what that world looks like so that you can begin to move your people through it and start to step it through as you're thinking about it, then you haven't done enough background work. I don't believe there is such a thing as writer's block. I know I'm going to take some heat, but it's out there. It's how I feel. I believe there is such a thing as writers not prepared enough. If you haven't done your preparations, when you get to the well, there's nothing to drink from, right? So you have to fill your well with character research, story research, and give yourself that heading. Whether you use the folders, you use note cards, however you do it, give yourself a heading so that you can start to navigate through that story as you write. So there you have it. That's what I do to get ready. Um, my preparation usually takes me two to three weeks in addition to what I do throughout the year, you know, with other writing and whatnot. But by the time November 1st comes around, I am absolutely ready to hit the road. This year, I, I think I can finish my book and have it completed by the end of November because I get the cheat step of having an extra 10 days in October to write. So that's my goal. I'm sticking to it. Um, I will be probably blogging, certainly blogging about it. I may do some video blogs as well. We'll, we'll see how that kind of goes depending on connectivity because I'm on a ranch in the middle of nowhere. So it's spotty at best, but um, I will be reporting back and I look forward to hearing your stories. If anyone decides to participate or just wants to use the momentum and you know, maybe you're gonna start writing that story or maybe you're gonna start putting your information together and putting some words on the page. I would definitely look forward to hearing in the group about what you're working on. And um, certainly if you get stuck, throw us a line because we've got lots of people that like to jump in and help out with advice and encouragement. Um, that's what we're here for. So thank you for having me and taking a peek at my process. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be a good year. Kathleen's saying probably what I'm saying, which is that was magnificent. <laughs> Once Kathleen turns her mic on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saying it for me. I didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Victoria. That was absolutely terrific. I know I have some questions and I imagine that Quentin and Yvonne probably do too. Are you able to stick around to answer a few questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I, I'll start off. Um, what, when it comes time to actually write, do you, you, do you write by hand or do you type into the computer? Good question. Um, I do both. And it depends on the level of pre-work that I've done. So uh, for example, I have in my current book, I have a side character named Chad. And that's really, I know that he's super fashionable. He's super upbeat and optimistic. He's a great, sweet little side character. And his last name is Brown. That is the extent of what I know about Chad. So 
if I were gonna if I were gonna uh, explore more of his involvement in the story, I'm gonna have to do some backstory. I'm gonna have to do some character work. So I would begin handwriting a hundred percent. Usually on note cards, I'm gonna go through my character cards and develop those cards for how they flesh him out. And then I'm gonna grab my timeline. I'm gonna unfold the whole big thing. And I'm going to start figuring out where does Chad fit in the timeline? And I'm just writing, okay, he's in elementary school here. He's in high school here. This is when he goes to the museum to work so that I just can really lock into what is his energy? What does he look like? What's his story arc? All that's handwritten. Then I'm going to start drafting just maybe some quick paragraphs by hand to get a feel for what he's like. All that that has to be handwritten for me. I don't brainstorm characters well digitally. I can do it if I have to, but it's not my preference. Once I've done that work, then when I'm ready to start inserting him into scenes and settings and, and I have a sense of, of where he belongs, then I'm going to go digital and I'm going to type that. And the simple reason is I have arthritis in my right hand and it's starting in my left. So I'm, I'm really bound by what feels good at the time. And for the most part, for writing long chapters, it's just easier to type it out. If I could write it all longhand, I certainly would. But alas, you have to work with the tools you're given. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Well, I'm, I'm happy to, um, there's a, quite a few things here. Um, I've just, I've, 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 I've thought about this in the past. Um, and I, every time I go to try it, something stops me, but this problem with arthritis and other bits and bobs, luckily I'm, I'm free. I had it in my, both my little fingers, but I seem to have, I changed my diet radically and it's disappeared, which is astonishing to me. Um, but, um, I wondered if you'd ever thought about using dictation instead of typing, mm -hmm. that would great be my question. first great question. question mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. And I have, I actually, I replaced my phone last weekend, which that I'd had my phone for seven years. So that's just been a roller coaster. You know how that goes. And I did find a voice to text app, which I'm going to experiment with when I'm, when I'm on the trip. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't done it enough yet to decide if I really love it or not. What I can say is I do talk to myself a lot. People hate working in the same room with me because I talk out loud all the time. So my suspicion is once I start experimenting and really getting into it, especially for dialogue, because you know you have a natural ear for conversation. And I think using that kind of an app is gonna help me key into dialogue. That's my suspicion, I don't know. And then descriptions. I have to disclose, I had up until, oh my gosh, probably two years ago, I had a little voice recorder, like the cassette tapes were this big. Now I'm dating mm -hmm. myself. I love that little thing. That was my little companion. And it finally gave up. But I would mostly I use that for setting. So if I'm, you know, I, I don't know, I, I'm in a, a lodge somewhere and, and I notice something about the fireplace, I can just tell myself those descriptions in a really detailed way so that I remember them so that I can capture those details to be able to mm -hmm. write them later. So that's what I've used it for in the past. But for the actual writing, I have not yet. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward yeah. to testing it out. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely going to be interesting. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. sort of in the same camp really with this. Also, uh, looking at technology, with the advance of AI now, uh, very shortly, we will be able to have real time two way conversations with AI chatbots. This is al already been implemented by a few people, but it won't be long before this happens. Um, I use AI a lot now, not for any creative stuff because it's completely useless for that. But um, what it, it's very, very good for research. And I'm, I'm thinking with this two way chat, this might be another way of creating dialogue. I don't know if you had any thoughts about this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. See, now I now you've got me out on my limb. Um, I I am very much a digital minimalist. So anything that I can do either by hand or as much as I can in my own mind, you know, sourcing my own creativity, that's my go-to. 
So I'm, I'm way more inclined, for example, to go to a restaurant, a coffee shop, someplace where there's robust conversation. I'm way more inclined to go there and sit and listen and take notes on how people say things, what, how their conversations go, just flat out eavesdropping. I admit it. <laughs> That's where I tend to find conversation nuggets, you know, just those, those little goodies that pop up as people are speaking to each other. I don't like to do it with television because obviously that's scripted. So it, number one, it's somebody else's work. And number two, it's not the same, but um, yeah, I, I listen to conversations a lot and I source those. So I, I tend to rely more on real people. I think. The, um, I, I'm, I'm three quarters of the way through James Michener's um, autobiography at the moment. I think it was uh, somebody in the group that recommended that to me, um, which I am loving it to bits. And he talks about his his writing process, which it takes him, he reckons on average, two to three years to finish a book, mm -hmm. which is great news for all those people who are worried about time. It's kind of the opposite of NaNoWriMo, isn't it, in a way? Um, but he says that he he primarily writes for himself but he understands that the point of a book is to be read therefore he hopes other people like this work <laughs> and he also says that he works he worked five hours a day from about seven till mid midday um religiously seven days a week once he was on a project and he would uh, get usually one page done a day right Ooh. and i thought this is brilliant for um especially new writers to understand that it isn't about um, you know, writing your novel like Agatha Christie did, for example, you know, one a month at her height. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, and also, despite his slowness, he still managed to create 30 pretty substantial books. Yeah. And of course, you know, um, the good living from this. Yeah. So that was just an observation. But my last question was, you mentioned with your trilogy, the, you know, this idea of, um, a three act play is excellent. And, and I love your clarity on making act two split into two. So you can have that sort of, you know, that changing point, all important changing point, right? Bang between those two bits. But when you go for a trilogy, what do you do then? Have you got three acts per book plus an overarching three acts? So, yes. Good oh. question. Good question. So, um, you know, we, we, talk in the the Zettelkasten group about um going deep into a niche and and figuring out you know really deep diving and and uncovering things and then bringing those discoveries back so you you've put your toe right into the middle of my deep dive because what I've done I, I don't know enough well I shouldn't say that many many of the novelists that I know use the three-act structure and, you know, it goes back to Aristotle and his poetics. So as I started thinking about what I wanted my deep dive to be, I, that was what drove my question. I thought, okay, I have three, potentially a series of books. How am I going to do that? So I went back to Aristotle and I read poetics and I really started to unpack the pieces of, of what was he really doing when he was you know, criticizing the dramatics or, or the poetics, what was he really doing? And in my mind, which this thought is about three quarters baked, it's not ready yet, but almost there. In my mind, he was addressing that issue of continuity and how do you discover truth and what purpose does the story serve for the reader as well as for the actor or the dramatist. So as I started thinking it through, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm looking at more of like, um, you know, an umbrella and under my umbrella, which has a series arc. So the trilogy as such as it is, has a series arc. So in book one, you get a glimpse of the big, big bad, but you don't battle that yet. First, you have to deal with minions and, and other lesser evils. But that book has a clear climax and I know what that is and I know what the cliffhanger into book two is. So then when we get into book two, it's essentially what you would consider the end of act two, part one into act two, part two, before you get into three. 
it's a continuation of that. So yes, the first book has a full arc, but the second book picks up where that arc leaves you. And then it has its own arc because we have to get way deeper into what the big, big bad is. And we need better tools. So book two is all about how do we populate our leaders, our, our anchor people with the tools that they need in order to get to the climax, the cliffhanger of book two, which gives them another big win, but it's not the big, big bad. That is what happens in book three. So you have the overarching structure and then you have each one within. Yeah, yeah, fabulous, <sighs> fabulous. Uh, I, really I, useful. Victoria, I am so impressed with your scholarship that you bring to your writing. <sighs> I think what that gives me, not only do I, you know, bow to you and I'm totally impressed with you, but you inspire me to say to myself, that's the road. That's the piece that that you, you really need to do. You have to be doing that level of scholarship to be. And that's your backdrop that creates the believability for the audience. Um, you know, it isn't enough to just carry it based on on emotion, which that's what I've been researching. You, you got to know what day of the week the 4th of the July was in that year, if it's going to happen in your story. All of those details matter, even if you don't, you know, you don't want to rub your reader's nose in that, but it's just, it clicks and it, and it avoids a scratchy mismatch that would spoil the authenticity of the story. So I, mm. I just, you hats off to you and I'm going to follow you as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Come along, come on along. Yeah, that's true. And I, I'll leave you with a, a, I think it's from the author K.M. Wyland. I, I could be wrong, but I think she coined the idea that you don't have to tell your readers everything about the story but your readers need to believe that you know everything about your story. And that has always stuck with me because, you know, there's a lot of things I know about these characters that nobody is ever going to know, you know, unless I write like the world of the conjuring stitch and, and pack all that stuff into it, like some authors have done, which is really cool. Um, but they need to know that you know it. And then it's like, it's like watching an ice skater. There's nothing worse than watching an ice skater perform and being afraid for them the whole time because they're wobbly. Like you have to watch like this. I don't ever want my reader to have to read like this. I want them to know I've got this. And if you want to know what color his underpants are, I can tell you the brand. You know, I mean, I know down to the, the minuscule, you know, I can get way in the weeds with my characters and what happened. And and because there is such a historical element to this series, all of the organizations in it, whether they are written good or bad, are real things. Many of the people in it, whether they are written good or bad, are real people. And so when bringing that level of real worldness to the story, I like to think of them as Easter eggs. So when, when someone reads that, you know, my main male character was was close friends with William and Elizabeth Friedman, the code breakers from World War One. I. I want somebody to go, well, who's this William Friedman guy and what did he do? And go look it up. And then you go down a whole nother set of stories because you get to see what where the story came from the history. Excellent. Yvonne, do have, you have any uh, any remarks or questions for Victoria before we uh, thank her and, and close our session for the day? Hi, Victoria. I just have a um, no questions, but just um, some appreciation for my invitation to this meeting because I'm not writing a novel or anything, but I do have some writing that I am trying to put out there. And um, so I love reading novels and I just am so, I guess, impressed with <laughs> the amount of work that goes into creating you know, a series or just a, a book in general. It's just, I, I just thank you for the insight. <laughs> and um, what I did want to say, oh, I appreciate you sharing your edits because that was a question that I had brought up and um, you did give me some, a way to like handle that. <laughs> so I good, appreciate, good. I appreciate being here. Thank you. Awesome. 
Okay, Victoria, uh, I'll let you close it out with any uh, closing remarks that you want to say to our Facebook group, and then we'll we'll close it off and post the recording so everyone can see it. Um, I think if I if I, I had to give you a parting thought, it would be wherever you are in your part of your writing journey, and I, I've said this more times than I can count, you have to trust that that's where you're supposed to be. It's easy for all of us to get down on our creative selves because we're not as far along as we want to be, or heaven forbid, we look at it and like, why can't I be where they are? I'm not even going to try because they've already done it all and they're so far ahead of me. Number one, remember that the story that you have to tell, whether it's a novel, a poem, a piece of nonfiction, your story matters because it's yours and nobody else can write it. And number two, don't get down on yourself on time. Give yourself a sense of urgency, set yourself up to win, whatever that means, and then be proud of your wins. And that's writing, whether it's every day, twice a week, whatever your goal is, be proud of those steps and trust the process. Because just like Quentin said, if you commit to it, you know, some writers write every day at the same time, some create a habit, some wait for creativity and, you know, the, the muse or whatever, whatever your process is, trust it and know that you'll get there if you just commit and do the work. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Victoria, for giving this presentation. Uh, I appreciate it so very, very much. And I'm sure all of the readers, all of our Facebook group people who couldn't uh, have a chance to log in will enjoy seeing the recording. So for sure. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> it was brilliant. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.